I don't know what it was like in your family when your kids were young, or maybe your kids are young now and tell you what it was like in our family. I don't know when it happened, but I think our kids must have gone to law school at some point. <laughs> you know, no matter how clear, how well thought out, how simple our house rules were, they found innumerable loopholes. <laughs> All of these vague exceptions, caveats galore. At times, they took our well-ordered system of standards and turned them into permission, if not an outright command, to do the exact opposite of what we wanted. As a parent, man, it made me nuts. If you're smart, it'll make you pray. <laughs> but you know, as parents, when we bring that stuff to the Lord, I, I kind of wonder if the Lord has a hard time keeping a straight face. You know, we're coming in, we're talking about our kids and their rule-bending self-justifications. We plead with the Lord, God, we just, all we want is for them to just obey. And then we move on from that and begin to discuss with the Lord uh, those things that we don't want to do, that he has very clearly told us that we are to do, and those things that we really want to do that, well, yeah, we just really aren't into that. We come up with all sorts of reasons, exceptions, special circumstances uh, that should excuse us, that, that should justifiably classify us as a unique and extraordinary case. It should exempt us from whatever it is that we're trying to get out from under. And what God really wants is that we would just simply obey him. <laughs> you know, it's, it's this tendency that we have toward rebellion, sin, that moves us and that moves our kids to search out all those loopholes and to excuse ourselves from just pure and simple obedience. And it's that same tendency uh, that we are very familiar with for ourselves and for our kids that is the driving force behind all of what we see in our passage this morning in 1 Samuel chapter 12. There, uh, God's prophet Samuel is guiding God's people, Israel, uh, through a period of, of transition they have been a people who have been led by God himself. Uh, yes, they were guided at times by God's judges or prophets, but God himself was their leader. Uh, but, now, but now the people have rejected God as their leader and they have asked for a king. And so now they will have a king to lead them, a king who they can only hope and pray will be following the Lord. So let's do this. Let's grab our Bibles. Open up to 1 Samuel chapter 12. 1 Samuel 12. When you find that, will you stand? I will read God's word and I encourage you to follow along. 1 Samuel chapter 12, beginning in verse 1. Then Samuel said to all Israel, I have carefully listened to everything you said to me and placed a king over you. Now you can see that the king is leading you. As for me, I'm old and gray, and my sons are here with you. I have led you from my youth until now. Here I am. Bring charges against me before the Lord and his anointed. Whose ox or donkey have I taken? Who have I wronged or mistreated? Who gave me a bribe to overlook something? I'll return it to you. You haven't wronged us. You haven't mistreated us. And you haven't taken anything from anyone, they responded. He said to them, the Lord is a witness against you. And his anointed is a witness today that you haven't found anything in my hand. He is a witness, they said. Then Samuel said to the people, the Lord who appointed Moses and Aaron, who brought your ancestors up from the land of Egypt, is a witness now present yourselves so I may confront you before the Lord about all the righteous acts he has done for you and your ancestors. 
When Jacob went to Egypt, your ancestors cried out to the Lord, and he sent them Moses and Aaron who led your ancestors out of Egypt and settled them in this place. But they forgot the Lord their God, and he handed them over to Sisera, commander of the army of Hazor, and to the Philistines, and to the king of Moab. These enemies fought against them. Then they cried out to the Lord and said, We have sinned. For we abandoned the Lord and worshiped the Baals and the Ashtoreths. Now rescue us from the power of our enemies and we will serve you. So the Lord sent Jerubel, Barak, Jephthah, and Samuel. He rescued you from the power of the enemies around you and you lived securely. But when you saw that Nahash, king of the Ammonites, was coming against you, you said to me, no, we must have a king reign over us, even though the Lord your God is your king. Now, here's the king you've chosen, the one you requested. Look, this is the king the Lord has placed over you. If you fear the Lord, worship and obey him, and if you don't rebel against the Lord's command, then both you and the king who reigns over you will follow the Lord your God. However, if you disobey the Lord and rebel against his command, the Lord's hand will be against you as it was against your ancestors. Now, therefore, present yourselves and see this great thing that the Lord will do before your eyes. Isn't the wheat harvest today? I will call on the Lord and he will send thunder and rain so that you will recognize what an immense evil you committed in the Lord's sight by requesting a king for yourselves. Samuel called on the Lord, and on that day the Lord sent thunder and rain. As a result, all the people greatly feared the Lord and Samuel. They pleaded with Samuel, pray to the Lord your God for your servants so we won't die. For they have added to all our sins, the evil request of a king for ourselves. Uh, Samuel replied, don't be afraid, even though you have committed all this evil. Don't turn away from following the Lord. Instead, worship the Lord with all your heart. Don't turn away to follow worthless things that can't profit or rescue you. They are worthless. The Lord will not abandon his people. Because of his great name and because he is determined to make you his own people. As for me, I vow that I will not sin against the Lord by ceasing to pray for you. I will teach you the good and right way. Above all, fear the Lord and worship him faithfully with all your heart. Consider the great things he has done for you. However, if you continue to do what is evil both you and your king will be swept away. Let's pray. Father, we, we ask this morning that you'd speak to us. God, that, that by your word and by your Holy Spirit, that you would address us individually, specifically. God, that, that we would hear from you and that we would respond to you. God, I pray that we would be willing to face our sin and Lord that we would comprehend your faithfulness your mercy and your kindness and Lord that we would run to you work in this time Lord we pray it in Jesus name amen be seated well as I said we, we pick up this morning here in chapter 12 at a transition point uh, think about it this way from the beginning of history, it has been God's practice to lead his people directly. And go all the way back to the book of Genesis. Think of Adam and Eve walking there in the garden and God walking with them and speaking to them in the cool of the day. Oh, think even of Noah. God speaking to him, giving him the plan, telling him what's about to happen and, and giving him the plan for the ark and for salvation. But then there's a, a turning point 
in the midst of Moses leading the children of Israel out of Egypt, there at Mount Sinai, when God begins to directly address his people, they respond and the people speak to Moses. Look at it, Exodus 20, verse 19. And, and they say to Moses, you speak to us and we will listen. But don't let God speak to us or we'll die. God is speaking to his people and they're like, no, 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 no. We don't want to hear directly from God. We, we want God to speak to Moses and then Moses can speak to us. And that becomes the normal mode from the time of Moses through the time of the prophets and the judges as God speaks through them to his people. Now, the prophets and the judges, they didn't rule over the people. God was their king. He was their ruler. But they were his, his messengers and his representatives to lead the people. And that model was the norm from Sinai until, well, until the time that we find ourselves in here now. The people at that point take yet another step back from the Lord. And even though God has been their king, they ask God to give them a man to be their king a man to rule over them. It wasn't what God wanted, but it is what they demanded, and it is what God eventually did give to them. Look at verse 1. Samuel said to all Israel, I've carefully listened to you, everything you've said. In other words, this is your doing, not mine. I've done what you asked me to do. I've placed a king over you, and you can see now that you have a king to lead you. In other words, Samuel saying, I'm no longer your leader. Now you have a king to follow. And since Samuel's tenure as the leader of Israel has come to an end, he here makes sure that there are no loose ends, no complaints about his leadership. And so partway through verse two, he says, I'm old and gray. I've led you from my youth until now. Here I am. Bring your charges against me before the Lord and his anointed. He's saying, listen, if I've taken anything from anyone, if I took your ox or your donkey, come, uh, let, let's, let's lay it out before everyone right here. Have I wronged or mistreated you? Hey, speak up. Now is the time. Have I taken a bribe? Have I overlooked something? Let's address that today. Samuel had great integrity as he served as a judge of God's people. And that, that's why he could stand up and say something like this without inviting a lynching. I mean, could you imagine any of our current political leaders uh, making an open invitation for public accountability like that? I don't think so. I mean, we wish, but no, that, that's not going to happen. And yet, friends, we should. It would be wise for us, for each of us, for all of us to, to stop, to consider, and to, to invite our community, our coworkers, our customers, to invite our friends, our, our spouse, our kids. Where have I wronged you? Where have I been unfair? Where have I taken advantage of you? Not in order to defend myself, but in order to see where it is that I have blown it. How have I led? Have I been fair? Have I been honest? Have I had integrity? Well, that's always to be our goal, isn't it? You and I, we're always to, to seek to the best of our ability to do what is right. We've also got to seek to the best of our ability to be willing to face our failure, our failure to do what's right. We need to be willing and able to confess our sin, to seek to make things right with those whom we've wronged, to ask forgiveness, to pursue reconciliation. We need to believe that what God's word says is true. 
passages like Proverbs 28, there in verse 13, where it says, the one who conceals his sin will not prosper. Well, that's what we want to do, isn't it? We want to hide our sin away. And just thinking if we can cover it, if we can, if we can keep others from seeing it, that maybe it isn't real. Oh, but what scripture says is that when we conceal our sin, we won't prosper. But look at what it tells us to do. Whoever confesses and renounces will find mercy. You and I, you and I, we have got to be willing to address our sin with those whom we've sinned against. We gotta be willing to do it. We've gotta be willing as well to be addressed by those whom we've sinned against. We've got to begin to take seriously the words of Jesus in passages like, like Matthew chapter 18. Uh, there, uh, we're told that uh, those who sin against us or those whom we have sinned against they should be able to come to us and confront us. And not only does that speak to a willingness on the part of the one who has been offended to come and to confront sin, and that's hard, isn't it? But it also speaks of a willingness of those who have sinned to be willing to be confronted, to allow others to come to us and say, listen, what you did here was wrong. Understand, what Jesus says here in Matthew 18, it's not a suggestion. It's a command. It's a command for, for his followers. Look at what Jesus says there. He says, if your brother sins against you, tell other people about it and then leave the church. <laughs> I think that's what most translations say because that's what most people do. It's not what it says, is it? If your brother sins against you, and I promise you, he will. If your brother sins against you, go. Tell him his fault just between you and him alone. Don't talk to seven people first. Go to that person and talk to them. Don't talk about them. Talk to them. And don't just walk away. Don't just pack your bags and move on. Face the issue. You see, there, there's a couple of problems here when we don't follow what God's word tells us to do. Relationship is destroyed and everyone suffers. And sin remains in the church and everyone suffers. We've got to follow the instructions. We've got to do what it says. And look at, look at this. Jesus says that if he won't listen, that's what we're afraid of, isn't it? That we'll go to someone and they'll, they'll just blow us off or they'll reject what it is that we say. If he won't listen, then leave the church and tell everyone about it. No, that isn't what it says either, is it? Take one or two others with you so that by the testimony of two or three witnesses, every fact may be established. Now, step, step two isn't to shun the person, uh, but rather it is to embrace them and to address the sin. To embrace the person, to value the relationship, and to address the sin. And step two is to go back to them with someone else, not in order to gang up on them, but so that there can be an impartial witness to the discussion. And then finally, if he doesn't pay attention to them, tell the church. That, that's when it's to be brought to church leadership because the body of Christ cannot harbor sin. We can't just allow it to sit and to fester. It has to be dealt with. Samuel here lays himself open. He invites others to come to him and say, listen, if I've wronged you, lay it out. I want to deal with it. He was willing. 
He was willing to have others expose his shortcoming, and so should we. So should we. It's now Samuel, a man of such great integrity uh, that in verse 4, they respond to him, you haven't wronged us. You haven't mistreated us. The people, even the new king, agree he has been a man of integrity. Well, that being settled, Samuel then begins a brief but broad history lesson uh, meant to show that even though God has always been faithful to them, Israel has not had integrity in regard to God. In other words, Israel or Samuel then says to the people, now it's your turn. I've given you opportunity to speak to me. Now I'm going to speak to you. Look at verse six. And Samuel said to the people, the Lord who appointed Moses and Aaron and who brought your ancestors up from Egypt is a witness. What is God a witness to? To Samuel's integrity in his dealings with the Israelites, but also now to their lack of integrity in how it is that they have dealt with their God. Verse seven, present yourselves, he says. It's your turn. So I may confront you before the Lord about the righteous acts that he has done for you and your ancestors. Now, that, that's not the sentence we expected to follow there, right? I mean, it's, it's interesting. Samuel says, listen, I'm going to confront you. And what we expect to hear is all the awful stuff that we've done in that moment. And ra rather, what Samuel says is, listen, what I, what I want you to see is how faithful God has been. What we need to see is how faithful the Lord has been. He's been so faithful, and he gives them this history lesson that, uh, that recounts God's faithfulness. Uh, when Jacob, when the children of Israel went down to Egypt, remember Joseph was, uh, was leading Pharaoh's household, and, and the brothers come, and they all take shelter in Egypt during a time of famine. But then uh, a new Pharaoh comes. They become slaves. And so your ancestors cried out to the Lord. And he sent them Moses and Aaron. Remember that whole thing, uh, the plagues and Passover. And Moses and Aaron led your ancestors out of Egypt. But they forgot the Lord their God. And so he handed them over to Sisera and to the Philistines, and to Moab, all the, all the nations that came against them throughout the book of Judges. And in the midst of that hardship, they cried out to the Lord and said, we've sinned. Isn't that just like us? Sometimes it takes a little heat before we're willing to deal with our stuff. And sometimes it takes uh, the Lord allowing us to feel a little bit of pressure before we are willing to broach with him our unfaithfulness toward him. Oh, but how does he respond when we confess our sin to him? <laughs> Look at verse 11. So the Lord sent Jerubbaal, Barak, Jephthah, and Samuel, and he rescued you from the power of the enemies around you, and you lived securely. God's been faithful. He's always faithful. Oh, not Israel. Israel has not been faithful. They, they have been unfaithful to the Lord despite his faithfulness. They actually turn away from him despite the fact that he has been perfectly trustworthy toward them, yet they reject him as their king and ask for a man to rule them. Look at verse 12. Samuel recounts for them, when you saw that Nahash, the king of the Ammonites, remember him, he's the guy who was gouging out eyes. We read about that last week. Uh, when he was coming against him, you said to me, no, we must have a king, a man to rule over us. And they asked for that, even though the Lord, your God, was your king. And so Samuel says, now, Here's the king you've chosen. This is what you've done. This is what you requested. Look, this is the king that the Lord has placed over you. Samuel makes it clear that they asked for a king because they didn't trust God. 
They did not trust their invisible God, but chose rather instead to trust a visible human like themselves. Talk about stupid. <laughs> you read this and you think, what were they thinking? And then we look in a mirror and it's all so familiar. We often make just the same mistake. We are so prone to putting our hope in heroes that we can see instead of trusting our invisible God. You know, that isn't the only option. We can learn to trust the Lord. Usually, though, it's a fairly uncomfortable process, to be quite honest. Paul describes what it was like for him in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 there, verses 8 through 10. Paul talks about what he and his companions went through in the midst of learning how to trust the Lord. Hey, here's how it started for them. He says, we were completely overwhelmed. That's not a good start. You start the day completely overwhelmed. You don't even want to think about where you're going to end. He says, we were completely overwhelmed beyond our strength. We even despaired of life. In other words, they, they were convinced that they were going to die. I don't, I don't mean like when I wake up with a cold and I'm sure I'm going to die. I mean like they were literally, actually feeling that their lives uh, were possibly about to end. You look at that and you think, why would God allow his people to experience something like that? Well, it, Paul says God had a purpose in it. Paul says there was a reason for it. He says we received the sentence of death so that. God had a purpose. God had a reason uh, for them to come to this place where they felt like they had a sentence of death over their head. There was nothing that they can do. They come to the end of their roof, the, the end of their resources. They could not rescue themselves so that we would not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead. Hey, God allowed them to get into a situation so desperate that they knew they couldn't fix it. They knew they couldn't handle it. They knew it was beyond their ability. Why? So that they'd learn to trust in God. So they would finally get to a place where they would be willing to trust in God instead of their own resources. Paul says he's delivered us from such a terrible death and he will deliver us. We have put our hope in him that he will deliver us again. We can trust him. You know what I love here is in the midst of the people's failure to trust God, in the midst of, of Samuel confronting them over the fact that they have very clearly and very stubbornly failed to trust God, Samuel's encouragement is for them not to give up. He's like, listen, guys, here's what you've done, but don't give up. Don't pack it in. Trust God. And trust God. Really trust him. And, and, and when Samuel tells him to trust God, what he means when he says that is more than just trusting God theoretically or theologically. It, it's really easy for us, isn't it, sitting here together with other believers, we can raise our hands. We go, oh God, I trust you, Lord. I trust you. But it's a lot harder out there, isn't it? It's a lot harder out there in the midst of the reality of life. What Samuel is asking them to do is to put their trust that is theoretical into action and to actually begin to obey God. Look at verse 14. If you fear the Lord, if you worship and obey him, and if you don't rebel against the Lord's command, then both you and the king who reigns over you will follow the Lord your God. You know, for years reading the Old Testament, one of my frustrations is when you read about one of these great kings who actually... Uh, have turned back to the Lord and they love the Lord. Some of the great kings of Judah and you just think, oh, there's finally hope for God's people. And then these knuckleheads don't follow them. And, you know, they just kind of halfway follow the Lord while there's a good king. And, and sure enough, the next king that comes along, the people just go wildly astray. 
you know, here's what I'm convinced of. And I think this, this statement here backs it up. Kings don't lead people. People lead kings. And that sounds nice and theoretical. It's like, okay, Old Testament stuff, whatever. Kings don't lead people and people don't lead kings. Presidents don't lead people. People lead presidents. You look at our, our nation and where we're at. It's not that we need a man to lead us. It's that we need to rise up and lead. Well, here Samuel calls them to both worship and to obedience. Do you notice that? Those two things paired together. Samuel's telling man, listen, worship God. Raise your arms. Passionately sing God's praise. Engage yourself in worshiping the Lord. And you know what? Continue to do that when you leave this place. It looks different out there, though. Out there, it looks a whole lot like just simply obeying the Lord. It works the same for us. When we come together, we have a great God. Our worship should be bold. It should be wholehearted. It should be passionate and engaging. And so should our obedience. It should be a willing, wholehearted obedience and not this, this uh, I'm doing it on the outside, but on the inside, I'm still kind of cranky about it kind of obedience. Hey, there should be no reticence or compromise mixed into it, but rather we should be wholeheartedly pursuing the Lord. That's what Samuel pleads with them to choose, to, to wholeheartedly submit themselves to the Lord. And part of how he speaks to them about this is that he reminds them again and again about the consequences of rebellion. Look at verse 15. He says, if you disobey the Lord and rebel against his command, the Lord's hand will be against you. He, he tells us all about the grace of God, uh, God's faithfulness, his mercy, but he does not fail to, to speak as well about God's wrath against sin. God deals with rebellion. And so he says, listen, if you disobey the Lord and rebel against his command, the Lord's hand will be against you. That's not good. That's very, very bad, okay? And, and as it was against your ancestors. And just in case they're not impressed by that, just in case they think God's a patsy, look at verse 16. He says, hey, now see this great thing that the Lord will do before your eyes. And I think they're thinking, ooh, cool, he's gonna do a trick. This will be fun. And then he says, isn't the wheat harvest today? He says, I'm going to call on the Lord. And he's going to send thunder. Uh, oh, but the thunder isn't what you have to fear. It's the rain. It's the rain during harvest, something that would destroy the crop so that you will recognize what an immense evil you committed in the Lord's sight by requesting a king for yourselves. Samuel called on the Lord, and on that day the Lord sent thunder and rain. And as a result, all the people greatly feared the Lord and Samuel. Uh, Israel has, has two seasons, basically. They have a rainy season and a dry season. The rainy season is from October to March. That's why we go to Israel in September. Yeah, that's during the dry season, April to September. And the wheat harvest, of course, would be during the dry season. And the rain, if it came during the harvest, could ruin the crop, which could lead to famine, which would mean their death. You see, what Samuel is showing them is that they should not mess around with this. That God is able and God is willing at any point that he deems necessary to discipline them, to reprimand them. Now, I know some of you have had harsh parents. And my kids aren't here to complain, but they might. But God isn't faulty like we are. He isn't a cranky, mean-spirited bully. That isn't what's going on here. He is a truly loving parent <laughs> 
who is going to discipline his child. We have all been around children who have not been disciplined, haven't we? That's not kind to us, and it's not kind to those children. But God is a good parent. Hebrews 12, 6 tells us the Lord disciplines the one he loves. Understand this. The Lord disciplines us because he loves us. Now, you may not feel like love when we're being disciplined, right? We get that. But the reason he's doing it is because he loves us. He punishes every son that he receives. We belong to him. And so he will address what needs to be addressed within us. And so the Israelites see God's discipline, his his reprimand about to come upon them as this storm comes in the midst of the harvest. And so verse 19, they plead with Samuel. It's nice that they plead with Samuel, but that doesn't stop the storm. But look at this. He says, pray to the Lord your God for your servants. But you know what? That's not going to stop the storm. This is, I, I think this is the saddest phrase in the whole passage. Do you notice what they say here? Pray to the Lord, your God. He's not our God. But this is what happens when you ask someone else to be a mediator between you and your God. When you think that the pastor is the only one who can hear from God. When you think that your spouse is the only one who can tell you what God wants. When you think that your parents are the ones who hear from God. He becomes not your God. But they're God. But then what they say next is what changes everything. For we have added to all our sins the evil of requesting a king. They confess their sin. They confess it. They come to God. We blew it. What we did was wrong. No excuses. No excuse, it was wrong. That's all that needed to happen, really, was for them to confess their sin, to repent of it, to cry out to God for his mercy. And I love, I love what I read next here in verse 20. As they confess their sin, Samuel begins to encourage them. He moves from, from telling them <laughs> the heat's coming. Here comes the storm because you have, you have rejected God as your king. And now as they confess their sin, Samuel says, man, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Take courage. Even though you've committed all this evil, he doesn't deny what they've done. He doesn't pretend it didn't happen. But he says, don't turn away from following the Lord. He sees this little spark of hope and he begins to fan the flame tells him, worship the Lord your God with all your heart. Don't turn away to follow worthless things that can't profit or rescue you. The Lord will not abandon you. He won't abandon his people because of his great name and because he has determined to make you his people. What Samuel is telling him is, listen, our God is faithful. He's faithful. He's faithful to forgive us. Remember what, what the Lord gave John in 1 John 1, 9, that if we will confess our sins, that God is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Do you know that to be true? Do you know it to be true, not just as, as a, a, a chunk of scripture, but do you know it to be true in practice in your life? Do you know that when you confess your sin to God, that he is faithful and he is righteous and he forgives you and he cleanses you? He's faithful. And you know what? If we'll let him, he is faithful to rescue us from temptation as well. Oh, we all battle temptation, don't we? Uh, So often we feel like the things that Uh, that trouble us, the sin that tempts us. It's just we're the only ones. And 
and, and no one else understands. Paul kind of blows that all up. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, he says this, no temptation has come upon you except what is common to humanity. Get over it, Paul says. You're not the only one. Everyone faces this garbage. But look at what he says. Look at what he says. He says, we all face this, but God is faithful. God is faithful. He won't let you be tempted beyond what you are able. Do you, do you hear that? Do you understand that? Do you believe that to be true? God will never let it come to a place where you can't say no, where you can't turn away. God will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation, he will always provide a way out. There is always a way of escape. You may not look cool taking it. It may not be comfortable. It might be embarrassing, but there is always a way of escape because God is faithful. And he is faithful to strengthen and protect us against the enemy as well. Listen to what he says to the Thessalonians in 2 Thessalonians 3.3. 3. The Lord is faithful. He will strengthen you. Do you feel weak? Do you feel weak? Weak spiritually, weak in your walk? He will strengthen you and guard you from the evil one. He's faithful. I think the best, the best of all of this is that despite our weakness, despite our frequent failure, he always remains faithful. Think of what he told Timothy, 2 Timothy 2.13. If we are faithless, you ever, you ever faithless? You ever find yourself failing yet again, choosing sin yet again? If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. In other words, Samuel says, don't give up. Don't give up. Don't give in. And don't pack it up. And no matter how many times you failed, no matter how often you've blown it, keep going. Keep confessing. Keep surrendering. Keep repenting. Keep seeking the Lord. Because he is always faithful to forgive and to cleanse and to protect and to rescue. You can't do anything about yesterday except confess and repent, right? And you can't do anything about what might happen tomorrow. Who knows? But at the present moment, in this moment, what you can do is to choose to wholeheartedly worship and obey the Lord. What you can do today is choose to serve the Lord with the whole of your life. Don't let the enemy condemn you over what is in the past. As Paul tells us in Romans 8, 1, there is now therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And don't let the enemy worry, about, worry you about what's coming next. Just seek and serve and love Jesus with everything that you've got today. The love of God for you is durable. It is more durable than you yet understand. And God is not easily dissuaded from loving us. It's not like you're dating God and just being really careful not to you know, show him the real you so that he runs away, right? No, 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 no. God knows the real you, and he is still convinced that he will love you. Think of what Jeremiah says in Lamentations 3, and there in verses 22 and 23, he says, because of the Lord's faithful love, we do not perish. For his mercies never end. You and I, we will never come to a place where we turn to the Lord where we confess our sin, where we repent and where we look him in the eye and he says, yeah, 
I'm out of that whole mercy thing for you. <laughs> you spent it all in one place, didn't you? You know, you, you're never gonna you're never gonna get a notification from the Lord. Order now, because there's only one left in stock, and it's not gonna happen. And no, listen to what it says. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. And it's not like God is saying, boy, by the time you get to the end of the day, you've pretty much spent it all and you better watch it till morning. That's not, no, no, no. What he's saying is you'll never come to the end of it. You'll never come to the end of God's mercy because he loves you. He loves you despite your weakness, despite your sin. And so you can return to him. Again and again, you can confess and repent and become the recipients of his blessing and his presence. His love for you is not dependent upon your good behavior, but it's dependent upon his faithful character. You and I, we are saved and we are sustained, not by our performance, but by his grace, by the cross, by our Lord Jesus. Well, verse 23, Samuel lets the people know that even though he's no longer their leader, even though they now have a king, in fact, maybe because they now have a king, he lets them know, I'm going to be praying for you. I'm going to be praying for you. He, he says, I vow that I will not sin against the Lord by ceasing to pray for you. And not only that, I will teach you the good and the right way. Samuel lets him know, I'm not abandoning you. Yes, my role is changing. I'm no longer the leader of Israel, but I am still going to speak God's truth to you. And I am still going to pray to God for you. Friends, that, that is my commitment to you as well. I, I will seek to faithfully teach you God's word, verse by verse, week by week, until Jesus comes back or until he takes me to be with him. And I will pray for you. I'll pray what Paul prays for the Ephesians. He says there, he prays that, that God may grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with power in your inner being through his spirit, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. I pray that you being rooted and firmly established in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the length and width, the height and depth of God's love, that you would know Christ's love that surpasses knowledge so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. And I hope that you'll crack Ephesians chapter three open from time to time and that you'll pray that for each other. And you'll pray that for me. And together, as verse 24 says, you and I, above all, we will seek to fear the Lord and to worship him faithfully with all our heart, never failing to consider or to remember the great things that he has done for us. <laughs> and then finally, because we're knuckleheads, um, Samuel returns to a warning there in verse 25, and he says, eh, yeah, and if you continue to do what's evil, both you and your king will be swept away. Don't forget that. <laughs> you know, Samuel has some great balance here. He reminds us of the faithfulness and the mercy and the, the grace of God without letting us forget the reality of the consequence of living in rebellion against God. You know, I don't think God could have warned his people, people more fully. I mean, what an amazing uh, passage this is for the people of God. And yet, as we read on from here, I, I have to wonder if they heard any of it, if they listened to it at all. What about us? Oh, I hope that the same could not be said of us. This morning, have you heard the Lord calling you to worship him wholeheartedly? 
and to obey him fully. Is your heart, is your will truly submitted to the Lord? You know, if it isn't, you can even ask him for that. Even ask him for the desire to submit yourself to him. Are you actively, passionately seeking to know him, to know his ways, to obey and to honor him? Well, that's what he invites us to. That's what he desires. That we would live a relationship with our Lord that is close, that is direct, where he speaks to us and we can speak to him. Stand and let's pray. Father, God, this is what we want. What we desire, Lord, is is to have that, that relationship with you that, that Jesus has redeemed us for. God, that the cross opened the way so that we can have it. And yet, God, so often we so foolishly forfeit it. We give ourselves to the distractions of sin and to compromise. Oh, Father... Give us hearts that are, are desiring intimacy with you, that are willing to confess our sin, to turn away from it, to receive your mercy and your grace. God, I pray that, that as a body of believers, as those who are followers of Jesus, that we would be willing to have our sin confronted and even when we have to, to confront sin in others. God, that's hard. We ask for your grace and your mercy. We ask for you to be right in the middle of it all. God, we want you to be doing a great work here in our midst, in our community, in our church. We ask you to work. We ask you to begin with us. God, we want to be a a church that worships you passionately, which means we have to be people who worship you passionately. Not just in song, but in the daily living of our lives. Work in us, Lord. Draw us to yourself. Keep us going. Remind us of your faithfulness. Encourage our hearts. We pray it all in Jesus' name.